weaves on a loom and plays the piano. She draws, she paints, and she is so crafty. She makes things out of almost anything that she can find. Um, Laura ran a nonprofit that helped Haitian women for nine years, and then she returned to the writing world, and she writes a blog called Nature Based. I love this blog. It just, every time I receive it in my email, it makes me so happy. So um, I encourage you to check it out. I think you would enjoy it as well. And uh, Laura has published 26 books and has a new book coming wow. out at the first of the year. It's called A Naturalist Book of Wildflowers. And Laura did all of the illustrations for this book as well as the text. And um, I'm just delighted because her presentation today is based on her book and she'll use some of the illustrations as her visuals. So um, please join me in uh, perhaps waving hello to give Laura a big warm Zoom welcome. Hi, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you so much for that wonderful, wonderful introduction. I remember Leo and Renee, sort of. Kind of. <laughs> That's awfully nice that you kept this book and that you've enjoyed it. My very first book came out um, 40 years ago and it was called Wildflower Folklore. And wildflowers have been a part of my life since way before then. I grew up in Sandy Springs and we had four brothers and sisters and we grew up on six acres of woods and there were a lot of wildflowers there. My mom was a wildflower enthusiast, so I became one as well. And I can just remember as a child, one of my most vivid memories was when she found a lady slipper growing in our woods and you would have thought she had won the lottery and, and much more. She was so excited. So, you know, I loved my mom. I loved her enthusiasm. And I am so happy that I have been able to continue her love of the native world and to spend a lifetime writing about the, the plants. I'm particularly um, excited about this new book coming out because it's the first book that I have fully researched, written, and done the have done the illustrations. I have science background from a degree in botany from the University of Georgia, and I have the art background from a certificate of um, botanical art and illustration from New York. Botanical Garden. So it's such a thrill to me to be able to, to um, combine these two and to put out this book called The Naturalist Book of Wildflowers. It was my thought before I went to a publisher that the book would sort of look like a field journal. Um, with all my notes and little arrows as to where, you know, the stamen were and all this stuff that I was so excited about um, sharing. And to some extent, it looks like that, but it's really cleaned up. So what I'd like to do today, and I'm gonna go to screen share at this point, and hopefully you'll be able to see this. Yeah, is that good? Looks great. Okay, great. So what I wanted to do today was to share some of the information that I put into this book, which is about all the native plants. I had, interestingly enough, quite a discussion with the publisher who said, well, you know, where are the dandelions? Where are the daisies? And I kept saying, you know what? This book is about our plants. This book is about our native plants, the plants that are native to North America and primarily to the United States. And they agreed, they said, okay, you're the author, you can do that. So I only included native plants. And part of the reason is that I feel it really important that people know what's native and know what um, the eeks, all right, my, hold on. Ah, there we go. Um, what is what 
we can celebrate as our own. So this is a copy of the cover of the book, even though it says celebrating 85 native plants, we're not gonna do all 85 today, but I did choose ones that are familiar, hopefully to you, and um, a lot about the gardening. For each of the plants that I wrote about in the book, I wanted to include information about their conservation status. If they were endangered, if they were invasive, you know, where are we with our, our native plants? Because even though they're native, they may be aggressive growers and things that you wouldn't want to grow in your garden. <clears throat> the second thing I wanted to include about each of the plants was their wildlife partners. What pollinates it, who eats it, you know, how they fit into their ecosystem, how they are a part of their surroundings and their bigger world. And of course, the folklore has been my love since I wrote the first book. So I included things about how the plants got their names and if they had um, medicinal value. There's a lot about medicinal usage of the native plants. And then of course, I wanted to include gardening. So these are um, the topics that are included for each of the plants. And these are the ones that I will base the talk on today. If you have questions, I would love for you to just make a note and um, we can stop periodically or at the end, um, I'll, I'll take any questions that you have. And having this wonderful group of master gardeners, hats off to you, oh my gosh, I'm so impressed with what you do and so grateful for what you do. But I may have a few gardening questions of my own for you. So I wanna start with Black Eyed Susan because it's such a familiar plant and one that almost everyone loves. It's a native to the prairies, although it's naturalized in most parts of the United States now. The seeds are eaten by many different kinds of birds, including chickadees, cardinals, nuthatch, sparrows, what, whatever. This little thing in the corner is a scale of justice because the black-eyed Susans for an unusual reason, and I don't know the reason, were considered a symbol of justice. So it's kind of interesting how each of the plants got to be symbolized or symbols for something different. Black Eyed Susan is obviously has been highly cultivated and they're hybrids that you can grow in the garden, which are just wonderful. Um, however, I love the natives. Almost always I'll go to the species rather than to the hybrids or the cultivars. Um, in my own garden, I grow a lot of Black Eyed Susans. If you grow Black Eyed Susans, you grow a lot of them. They are pretty aggressive, but they stay fresh looking for a long time and the blooms last a long time as well. So in my garden, I like it and I'm very happy to have it growing. If you grow it in and amongst other plants, so you have to keep on top of it because it is an aggressive grower. The prickly pear cactus is very widespread. It grows in each of the states west of the Mississippi and many of the states in the east as well. It is an extraordinarily adaptive plant. It can withstand temperatures to minus 50 degrees Fahrenheit all the way up to well over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And unfortunately, we know that it withstands temperatures as climate change changes and um, our, our temperatures become more extreme. It puts stress on the plants. And this is one that obviously, you know, digs deep, can survive with very little water and is very adaptable. The fruit of the cactus is called a tuna in um, Mexico, and you can extract the juice from the tuna, and it's even available commercially. However, if you do this, be very certain that you get all the spines out before you start extracting the juice. The spines are barbed at the end, and are extremely difficult to get out. 
So you don't want to be swallowing these things. They were so um, barbed and so sharp that some of the Native American tribes actually used them as fish hooks. The tunas, the cactus comprises about 50% of the food source for the black-tailed prairie dogs. This little black guy in the, in the corner is a cochineal bug. The bug feasts on the cactus plants. And within the intestinal system of this small bug, they put out carminic acid as um, a deterrent for predators. Well, if you grind up the bug and the acid that's in it and mix it with water, it turns bright red and is almost tasteless and is the primary source of red food coloring. Even now, the only other source for food coloring is a synthetic petroleum product. So next time you grab another piece of red velvet cake, you might wonder where that red came from. But it's, um, it's a great plant and lots and lots of um, interest and it fits into its ecosystem really well. The evening primrose, probably many of you grow this. The yellow is Enothera biennis. The pink, which is Enothera speciosa, is maybe even more common and more commonly grown. It is another very aggressive grower. I have it growing in my yard and I take great pains to stay on top of it because I know it'll just take over everything else. But I, I have a lot of those plants and for a long time I thought, you know, all these aggressive growers are going to outcompete one another and I'll just have lots of flowers, but that's not exactly how it happens. It does seem that they don't grow side by side, they grow in and amongst one another and it's not always a real pleasing um, um, thing to look at. So I try to stay on top of my aggressive growers that do really well and, and produce wonderful color, but I try to keep them in balance. It's like having a very enthusiastic grandchild and it's like, you know, okay, we can do this, but let's stay on the porch. So in a theory of Vianna's, each part of the plant is edible. The leaves, the root, the buds, the seeds were roasted almost and used like you would um, use poppy seeds. So it's a great plant to have and to enjoy. It is the host plant for the rare and endangered um, primrose moth. So this is the caterpillar, that's the little moth that feeds pretty much primarily on Enotheria species. Golden rods um, do not cause hay fever. It is the ragweed which blooms at the same time that does call, cause hay fever. There are many, many different kinds of golden rods growing and native to the United States. In Europe, it was considered such an important medicinal plant that they gave it the name Solidago, which means to heal or to make whole. It was used medicinally some by the Native Americans here. Um, the Navajo smoked the dried leaves and thought it would bring good luck. The Muscawi made a tea from the leaves to help a child who would not talk or laugh. So if you have need for those, now you know where to go and, and get good luck. The um, soldier beetle often feeds on the goldenrod. So especially late in the season, if you go out, you'll see thousands of these golden beetles. The leaves are eaten by many small mammals, including rabbits and possums and um, other, other squirrels will eat them. Squirrels will eat everything in the garden. Even if they don't want it, they seem to eat it. Um, the goldenrod is a state flower for Kentucky and Nebraska, South Carolina, and Delaware. <clears throat> okay, just in case you didn't know which was the jack and which was the pulpit, I drew it out for you here. The pulpit, of course, is the spade, and the spadix is the, the jack, and you can tell here the difference between the two. 
Jack in the pulpit is tactically poisonous. It has calcium oxalate crystals within the plant so that if you grab the plant or hold it or pick it, these crystals become embedded in your hand, or if you would eat it, it would come, become embedded in um, your tongue. And it's very uncomfortable, apparently. I haven't, I haven't tried it, but the root itself is poisonous, is edible. If you take it, boil it, dry it, and then grind it into powder. But it was one time called Indian turnip because of the root. The berries that form in the fall are eaten by wild turkey and other game birds. According to superstition, if you take a berry from the Jack in the Pulpit plant and drop it in a cup of water, if the berry turns clockwise, someone who is sick will become well. If it turns counterclockwise, they will not become well. So I don't know where the superstition came from, but it's kind of interesting. Growing Jacqueline Pulpit in the garden takes patience. It's, um, it takes a long time for the plants to actually produce bloom, like three years. I just ordered some from Gardens of the Blue Ridge and I, I'll have to mark it because otherwise I'll dig it up to put something else in there, I'm sure, waiting for it to bloom. But once established, they form colonies and um, individual plants will live up to 25 years. So it's, if you're patient and if you mark it and you stick with it, uh, Jack in the Pulpit is a great wildflower addition to the garden. Sunflowers are another prairie plant. It was one time thought by the pioneers that if you grew sunflowers close to your house, it would be protection against malaria. Uh, sunflowers are one of our few economically important native wildflowers. It's grown for the seed and primarily for the oil that you get from the seed. This is another plant that has been heavily hybridized. There are um, cultivars now that have been hybridized for their height and size, and their name is um, Sunzilla is one of the, the names for the cultivars, but also fortunately they have been hybridized to be small and to fit into more sizable gardens as well. Um, some flowers were found in ancient prehistoric sites in Arizona, not the flowers themselves, but carved discs of the sunflower. The sunflower was um, particularly special to the Incan people of Peru because they worshiped the sun and the priestesses would wear golden discs of sunflowers as a symbol of the sun. <clears throat> Everybody knows and loves bloodroot. It's one of the first um, wildflowers to grow and to bloom in the, um, in the spring. Interestingly enough, the leaf stays curled around the bud until it's pollinated. And once the plant is pollinated, then the, both the flower and the leaf open up. And as you know, the leaf of the bloodroot continues to grow until about midsummer, so they can become quite large. Both the common name and the botanical name Sanguinaria refer to the blood red sap that you find in the root. Native Americans use this to dye. It was mixed with either bear grease or walnut oil and used to dye blankets or um, baskets. It is very toxic, but it was used cautiously by both pioneers and Native Americans um, medicinally to treat coughs and colds. At one time it was thought that there was, um, it was useful and it was actually included in toothpaste and mouthwash, but when it was found that it caused a precancerous um, condition, it was discontinued. Today though, particularly in Europe, uh, chemicals from the blood root are included in um, as a supplement for livestock food. 
Hunt Berry, a very close relative of our beloved Eastern dogwood tree, the Cornus. This is a ground cover, it only grows a couple of inches tall. And it is really not a spectacularly beautiful or um, obvious plant in the, in the woods, but it is most interesting because it is considered the fastest plant on earth. What happens is that um, as the plants mature, the, um, the flower stays closed up as a bud, but as the plant matures and as it begins to open, those blossoms as petals become, and true, like corn is like the dog with these are bracts and not petals, but they become elastic. So they're closed up and when the plant is ready, they spring back all of a sudden and pollen shoots out of this plant at a rate of 24,000 meters per second. It, it would take a camera that could take 10,000 frames per second to catch it, which of course somebody has. And if you go online and look this up, there are actually videos of, of this um, exploding and this, the pollen goes like six feet in the air. It's just amazing. I just, I love that story. I, I love the fact that, you know, people say, oh, plants never move. They don't do anything. Well, look at this, buddy. This is just such a great plant. Um, this in the corner when Prince Harry married Meghan Markle, her wedding veil included floral emblems from each of the 53 Commonwealth countries. The fact that they're 53 Commonwealth countries was a bit of a surprise to me, but bunchberry or this particular plant was used as floral emblem for Canada. The berries are eaten by chipmunks and possums and several other um, small mammals. <clears throat> Ginseng is another plant that's not just won't knock you off your feet when you're walking through the woods, but it, it has been used in folk medicine wherever it grows for many, many, many centuries. In China, it is um, prized in aphrodisiac and heart stimulant. The Native Americans used it to treat headaches and fevers. And today it's most used, often used as just a general tonic, tonic to relieve stress, promote relaxation, lower blood sugar and blood energy. I could have used some ginseng last week during the election week. Wherever it grows, it has been used and revered. The Cherokee name for it is the plant of life. And in China, it's considered a dose of immortality. The first year, the root is very small and there are only one or two leaves, but each year the root becomes larger and there are more leaves. So theoretically, it's illegal in most states to, um, to grow this, I mean, to pick this until it has at least three leaves for it. So the wood thrush eats the berries and helps distribute the leaves and the the um, berries and seeds. <clears throat> Indian pipe. If you've ever seen this growing in the woods, then you will recognize it. There's nothing else that looks remotely like it. It's translucent, it has no chlorophyll, it has no color to it, but in spite of this, it has petals just like a regular flower does. It, um, is, has a symbiotic relationship with fungus in the soil and it often grows around beech trees. It was beloved by um, Emily Dickinson. She said it was her favorite flower and she wrote a poem about it, white as an Indian pipe, red as a cardinal flower, fabulous as a moon at noon. And she chose the Indian pipe as the cover of one of her books, um, poetry. If you pick this, it will turn up black immediately. And it, as it matures, you'll find small bits of pink and blue, I mean pink and black around the petals. 
American lotus, there are only two species of lotus worldwide. And the American lotus, Nilumbo lutea, grows throughout the East in wetlands and swamps and um, all the way from Minnesota South to Florida. It can be invasive in some areas, but generally not. It is not that plant that you see covering ponds that are you know, choking out the native vegetation. The plant and leaves are um, eaten by mallards and Canadian geese and um, nor northern shovelers. In the garden, it's a wonderful addition to a, a, a water garden does um, need at least three months of temperatures between 75 and 85, and it needs full sun before it will bloom. Um, the sacred lotus of Asia, Nilumbo nisifera, has seeds that have been tested to last over a thousand years, meaning they have found seeds that they were able to date back a thousand years. For the American uh, lotus, the seeds last merely um, 200 years. The seed pod, the lotus pod, of course, is beloved by people who do dried flower arrangements. It's just an unusual and wonderful um, seed pod. The, the lotus has this thing called the lotus effect, which means that it cleans itself. When water falls onto the leaf, it gathers together the, uh, any dirt or pollen or, or debris that is on the leaf. And as it slides off, it takes that dirt with us. The lotus also can um, self heat regulating, meaning that even when temperatures fall, that it will maintain a pretty steady um, temperature. The mayapple, Potophyllum peltatum, grows prolifically in our woods, and it's one of the plants that forms huge colonies. It's only the plants that are mature enough to have two different leaves that will produce a flower. The flower is usually more nodding than I've shown it here. I think I have a picture of it. Um, and is found in the, the fork of the plant itself. The, the fruit um, forms in late summer and was used by Native Americans and early settlers at, to, as flavoring. It's said that if you take the juice from this and mix it with um, wine and sugar, that it makes a pretty passable drink. I always thought maybe it was just uh, just the wine itself would be a pretty passable drink. The name Potophyllum means foot leaf and the, um, the leaf itself, if turned upside down, has an umbrella shape, which gives it the other common name, umbrella leaf or foot leaf. There is a drug which is um, made from compounds found from, extracted from mayapple. And this was um, used, they were hopeful that it was would be used in cancer, but now it's only used as um, a um, drug to treat genital warts. I have to stop and ask you, can y'all hear the, uh, the lawnmowers and leaf floors in the background? No. Okay, good, because I can't and I didn't want it to, to be distracting. It's only slightly distracting for me. What happened to rakes? Don't y'all just miss rakes? Okay, pokeweed. Pokeweed is a very um, big, bright, and bold plant. Just looking at it, if you take it out of context and just look at it, it's a magnificent plant. It's got these great blue, black, shiny berries and these white flowers, but it is so aggressive and so weedy. It is said that if you take poke berries and feed them to chickens, they will become more lively. The um, Native Americans and settlers made an ink from the berries. It's pretty fugitive though. It doesn't last very long. Um, and James Polk, when he ran for president, chose the poke weed as his um, symbol. There is a Biden's sunflower and I, I kept wanting the Biden campaign to adopt it, but uh, 
didn't have much luck with that. Uh, pokeweed is very toxic. And as it ages, the toxicity increases dramatically. In Appalachia, they eat this, um, the young plants, but even so, you have to change the water several times from boiling it, discard the water, and do this several times before you eat it. But um, it's considered quite tasty, and it's called poke salad. The water lily is similar to the lotus, but the water lily and leaves and blossoms float on the surface of the um, water, whereas the lotus is, um, has stems and both the leaf and the, the flower will stand above the water. The seeds can be popped like you would pop popcorn and the rhizomes and seeds are eaten by um, snapping turtles and other, other turtles. The unopened buds are thought to be particularly tasty and each part of this is, um, is considered edible. Yarrow, I'm sure y'all know yarrow. It grows throughout the temperate world in North America, in Asia, and in Europe, you will find this species, the white yarrow myfolium. It has been cultivated, of course, so that now you can have gold and yellow and cream and red and pink and all kinds of different colors of yarrow. The, the species, the genus was named for Achilles, the hero of the Trojan War, who um, used the leaves to help wounded soldiers during the Trojan War. Chemicals within the leaf have been known to help stop um, blood flow. So it's called staunch weed or wound wart because the leaves packed into a wound will help, will help stop the bleeding. Um, of course, you remember that Achilles was thought to be invincible except in his Achilles heel. And of course, during the Trojan War, he was shot with an arrow in the heel. The, um, the plant yarrow is a, um, is a host plant for many different kinds of butterflies and um, moths. Blue canis does not grow in the east, but it grows prolifically in the west and is, was one of the most important food sources for Native American Western tribes, including the Nez Perce, the Cree, the Blackfoot, Flathead, and coastal Salish um, tribes all depended on the bulb of the camas plant. In permanent villages, they would build these very elaborate ovens for um, baking the, the camas bulbs so that they would put ponderous pine and, and um, fur at the bottom, then they would put boulders and they would heat that and then they would put moss and then the bulbs and then cover this with bark dirt and then the fire on top and leave it for two or three days for it to bake down into it. The bulbs were thought to be so sweet that the um, Kalish name for it is sweet bulb. Paca gophers also thought that these bulbs were so delicious that they would store vast numbers of them in their holes. And this is found by the Nez Perce Indian women who would go and rob the pocket gopher holes to find the stash of bulbs. The bulbs were considered so valuable that they were often given in small bags um, as gifts for the birth of a new baby or um, a wedding present. Okay. I have many favorite wildflowers, but this fringe gentian has to be one of the most beautiful flowers in, in the Eastern United States anyway. It grows all the way from um, the north, from Canada down to the mountains of Georgia. It is a stunningly beautiful flower. Its name, Gentian comes from the um, Hungarian King Gentius, who um, centuries ago 
was king and a healer. And the legend says that there was a plague which came to um, his people and began killing people in, in huge numbers. And Gentius was um, desperate. So he prayed to God to give him guidance as to what would help cure his people. Shot an arrow into the air and it came down on the gentian plant. And so the legend says that he made a concoction from the plant and it helped his, his people get over the pestilence, the pandemic, the plague. Anybody have a bow and arrow? We should maybe try it. The gentian was also the basis of the symbol for the Minamoto clan, one of the four great clans in Japan. Pioneers used gentian to flavor gin and the gentian um, mixed with um, flax and primrose and several other plants was thought to be um, a soothing tonic to take in the spring. Iris, so many different kinds of irises in the United States, 28 different species native to the United States. The iris was named for the goddess of the iris, uh, the goddess of the rainbow, whose name was Iris. And this name was given not only to the goddess, but to the center of our eye, the iris of the eye. <clears throat> In um, the first century AD, Clovis I, who was king of the Franks, was um, fighting a desperate battle. And he thought that he was um, separated from the rest of his army by water, by a lake. But the legend says that he looked across the lake and he saw the yellow flag iris growing midway across and realized there was a bog, not a lake, and he was able to march his army to safety. After this, he changed um, the symbol on his banner from three frogs to, um, to three irises. Good, good move, I think. Um, Louis VII revived the symbol of the iris and stylized it in its was known as flower of Louis or fleur de lis. Iris too were used to flavor gin and many other different kinds of alcohols. Um, the iris, several different iris species in Europe are used commercially in the, um, in the perfume industry. And the yellow flag iris yields a, um, the root will yield a dye that is brown or black, which is, you know, a really dark black. It's kind of rare for natural dyes. Um, it's great in a wildflower garden. It takes a while to get established. And it's again, one of those that you really need to um, mark because it will disappear in the summertime. So if you're like I am and you have a bare spot in the garden, I just get so excited. I just, oh, yay, a place that can plant something else. And then later realize that, oh, that's, that's where that iris was. So I continue to try to grow iris. I do not have a great colony of iris at the moment. Passion flower, what a terrific, wild looking plant to grow in your garden. It needs sun and it needs support. It's an aggressive grower. It will grow a lot, a lot and you know, dozens of feet in a single year. <clears throat> the passion flower is called passion based on and refers to Christ. And it was thought that the blossom itself looks like um, the crown of thorns. The flower, the fruit of the passion flower is called a maypop. And when it matures in late summer, it's about the size of a kiwi, it becomes soft and yellow and is quite edible. Local wisdom has it that if you split it open the, the maypop and scoop out the pulp, the, the best way to do it is to eat it and then just spit out the seeds. <clears throat> the Cherokee name for passion flower is a koe and both the um, river and the um, valley in Tennessee are named this. Passion flower tea was used um, 
pretty extensively to um, treat insomnia and as a soothing tea. And apparently it's still quite popular in Europe. <clears throat> salvia, blue salvia, the great blue salvia is a truly a spectacular plant. It grows throughout the East, um, particularly in the more Northern reaches of our state. It was called Syphilicus because at one time um, it was believed and hoped to cure syphilis and it was sent to Europe for this purpose, but unfortunately testing did not prove this to be true. The red salvium, which we know as cardinal flower, is much more common and it's a terrific plant to use because it's so bright. It blooms mid to late summer and will just create this blaze of color. Both the cardinal flower and the cardinal bird were both named for the um, red robes worn by the cardinals of the Catholic Church. Violets, there's so many different kinds of violets and it's easy to tell if you're looking at a violet, but it's kind of difficult to identify it down to a species level because they interbreed and because it's just, they look very similar, so many of the species. They're actually 87 to 90. Nobody can quite determine how many um, species of violets native to the United States. I don't know where the word shrinking violet came from, but every time I'm out in my backyard weeding the flower beds, I think there is nothing shrinking about these violet leaves that seem to come in everywhere and they're persistent and they're hard to get rid of. So uh, shrinking violet is not in my vocabulary. There are many different kinds. The uh, native Johnny Jump Up is particularly beloved, although it is considered endangered in the several um, different states. The legend of the violet dates back to the times of Zeus who fell in love with a nymph named Io. Hera became, Hera being Zeus's wife, became quite jealous and demanded that Zeus turn Io into a white cow. Well, not surprisingly, Io was not thrilled with this turn of events and began to cry and where her tears fell, the violence began to grow. Mourning doves are said to love the seeds of violets, Actually, if you go out into your woods or your, my garden anyway, you may not have uh, violets now, you'll see the fall flower of this, which is a blind flower. It doesn't fully open, but if you go and look at the base, you'll see these little closed, almost like seed pods. So it's kind of interesting. The violets are edible. They're tasty. You can crystallize them by dipping them in um, a foamy egg white solution and then sprinkling them with super fine, um, super fine sugar and they'll crystallize the heart. And you can also just use it as a garnish on a cupcake or whatever. Violets are just great plants to use with kids because they're a pH indicator. You can grind up just plain the common blue violet and put something like um, lemon juice to it and it'll turn green. And if you put something base to it, like baking soda, it will turn um, red. So it's just, it's a fun plant to use and because they're common and you can pick, you can make jelly with them. They're great, except the leaves, which I've already talked about. Bee balm, another edible plant. The leaves and the flowers were made into a tea particularly by the Oswego Indians, and this plant is often known as Oswego tea. It is pollinated by ruby-throated hummingbirds, by many, many different butterflies. I have a lot of this growing in my backyard, along with phlox and other plants. And in that midsummer, when I walk out and startle the butterflies, it's like this wave of color floating up and then resettling. It's just magnificent. Bee balm is quite well named. It does attract bees as well, particularly the native bees and is an important pollinator plant for the bees. The Cherokees made a um, tea for its soothing quality. And you can use the plants not only as 
food and garnish, but also uh, they maintain their scent and you can use it in um, native potpourri. It's a member of the mint family shown here by the little square stem and if you take stem and twirl it in your fingers, you can feel the ridges of it, but it, it's actually square, which is another great thing to show the kids. <clears throat> Um, Columbine is fascinating for its, um, it's part of the ecosystem. A Columbine, 10 to 40,000 years ago, when there was a land mass, the Bering Strait, it is said that a species of Columbine was brought across that and brought to the United States, brought to North America. As it made its way, south from Alaska, it evolved into different species. And, this, and the species that um, were created, evolved, were based on the pollinators that were common in that area. So in the West, you have columbines with very long spurs. And that's because in the West, you have a profusion of hawk moths with their incredibly long beak, which has the capacity to get into these long spurs. In the East, the yellow and red columbine has much shorter spurs and is a great pollinator plant for the ruby-throated hummingbird, which in comparison, has a, a much shorter beak. The shortest spurs of the columbine are pollinated by bumblebees, which of course have little capacity to dig deep. So I just think it is so fascinating that these, the morphological um, parts of the columbine developed based on the local pollinators. Combines have been hybridized in their many cultivars, which are startling colors, bright red, bright blue, bright, orange, all the, mm, I don't know that there's an orange columbine come to think of it, maybe, you'll have to let me know. Anyway, most of the color cultivars are based on um, and hybridized from a uh, European species, not our native species. The, um, all the books, even mine, say that a columbine will reseed readily. And it took about three years for me to realize that they actually do. I have 20 seedlings now, <clears throat> which are just beautiful. And the leaves are still green. They still look fresh and nice right now. So I'm a, a new convert to um, columbine enthusiasm. I just think they're a great plant. They um, attract pollinators and stay nice looking in the garden. So many plants by this point, you just go, oh, go away. What, what happened to you? It must be the end of the summer. Well, it's November, right? Echinacea is another one of our native plants that is very um, economically important. The seeds are eaten by many different birds in the plant and root itself or made into tea, which apparently in um, Europe is still quite popular. Lady slipper, wow, what a plant. Difficult to grow in the garden, but a fabulous, fabulous native orchid to enjoy in the woods. You know, I kind of like the fact that you can't grow it in your garden. Some things should just be appreciated in the wild. Milkweed, even though there are probably, I don't know, 60 different species of milkweeds native to the United States, only about a third of them are host plants for the monarchs. So if you grow milkweed for the monarchs, um, you need to make sure that you grow, grow the ones that are conducive to um, hosting the monarch, which is so critical to that population. The seeds, of course, are these fabulous downy parachutes, sickly parachutes that were at one time used for stuffing in pillows. And the trilliums. Wow, there's so many beautiful trilliums, particularly throughout the East and in the Pacific Northwest. The trillium was known, the Cecil trillium was known as birth root or death root. And so it was often used during childbirth, thinking it, was, it would ease the pains of childbirth. Um, the white trillium is the floral emblem for Ontario. 
in the province in Canada. Unfortunately, the deer have almost decimated this population. Um, they're fabulous trilliums throughout our woods and I encourage you to go out. There's an old superstition which says, if you pick a trillium, you'll cause it to rain. A better superstition and fact is that if you pick a trillium, you kill it. The leaves, which you, I mean, if you pick a trillium, you pick the leaves and the leaves are needed to produce food for the following year. So they are endangered um, and it's illegal in several states to actually pick the trillium. So another one just to enjoy in the woods. <clears throat> Gardening with native plants, I think is critical and so much fun and such a wonderful thing for all of us to do because when we include the native plants, we also are supplying and providing um, pollen and a, a space for the different native pollinators. Even though we're accustomed to dividing horticultural zones vertically so that you know zone two and three are up here and then going on down to seven, what are we, A or B, and then down to zone nine. So these horticultural zones are based on minimum temperature, but a different way to look at growing native plants is to base them on ecosystems. So these are very, very broad ecosystems. This whole green is the Eastern woodlands, the Great Plains, but think about what else grows around, how they fit into their natural ecosystem when you include these plants. Now, this is probably a strange slide to end with because obviously this is not a wild and native garden, but this is my house, this is my front garden, and I've gardened very differently in the front than I do in the back. Obviously, these petunias aren't native, but Look at what I included, you know, the white echinacea, the blue salvia, the pink enothera, the pink yarrow. It's just so wonderful to be able to include all these native plants in with other plants for a more formal garden. So wherever you garden, however you garden, I would really encourage you to include the natives because they're our babies, they're our, our legacy. They are the most wonderful plants to include in a garden. So I'm going to leave the slides there and come back. Laura, I just want to tell you, that was wonderful. Just, just like reading your book, I just didn't want it to end. I wanted to keep <laughs> going and going. <laughs> Well, I'm sure there are a lot of people on Zoom who are glad to be able to walk off and come back. <laughs> and I'd, I'd like to open it up to um, all of my, my wonderful members here. If there's comments or questions, um, feedback, we'd, we'd love to hear from all of you. Got one. Hi. Hi. Um, this is Donna Weitzel, and I have a question for you, Laura, about your art. Um, is this watercolor? Is this gouache? Is it a digital drawing? How did you create those beautiful? Uh, um, it's all watercolor and pencil. The um, program at the, at the New York Botanical Gardens is this two-year program, so it's pretty extensive, but almost all traditional um, Botanical art is is watercolor. Thanks. That, they're just gorgeous. I yeah, could thanks. It was listen to you all day. <laughs> Linda, this is Tom Redmond. Um, I've been a Linda Martin fan for a long time. I sort of have grown up on your meadow book. <laughs> uh, and I love the pictures of all those things, but then you then I have to figure out, well, how in the heck do I grow them? Yeah. Uh, and you do a great job in the Meadow book uh, explaining how even with very small amounts of property, up to big amounts, I guess, uh, they're just remarkable ways to bring the great prairies and the wonderful wildflowers that I have people coming over and say, how did you do that? I, okay. I, I don't see those things at Pike's Nursery and so on. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. I'm glad you did it. I'm glad you had success with it. I have a question. Okay, may I ask? Hold on. Let me turn it off. 
Um, if you had five um, choices in a woodland shady garden, which of those that you've talked about would you pick to, to grow? Shade. Well, shade, full shade. Yes. I would probably start with um, May apple because you've got, it'll spread easily. I would then do um, blood root. I did not talk about wild ginger, but that's also another great one to use because it's evergreen. And I did not talk about um, phlox, but the creeping blue phlox is a staple in, in my shady garden. It just, it's evergreen. And another one that I didn't talk about, but is of great horticultural value is chrysogonum green and gold. It's a small ground cover and it is a terrific, terrific um, horticultural plant. Is Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. How do you spell that, the last one, the ground cover? Um, green and gold is the common name or chrysogonum, C-H-R-Y-S-T-O-G-O-N-U-M. I'm glad I asked, thank you. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> thank you. You mentioned trillium and I've tried and I never can get it to grow. What are your secrets? Well, trillium is a very difficult plant to transplant and only the Cecil trillium or the wake robin um, is recommended for growing in um, most wildflower gardens. It, like the lady slipper, sometimes needs a fungus in the soil. So I would, first of all, recommend buying from the most reputable nursery that you know, since you know it's not wild grown, and then making sure that it's deep, humusy, rich soil with good drainage. Okay, thank you. And that it doesn't get too much sun so that, you know, it, it bakes in the, in the hot summertime. What, what was the second plant you recommended after uh, mayapple? Blood root. Blood root. Blood root. Blood root mayapple. Blood blue root. phlox. I don't know if y'all grow blue phlox or not, but it is just, once you get it established, it is a fabulous, fabulous plant. Do you have a good source for some of these rarer plants that you mentioned? You, um... you know, I like Gardens of the Blue Ridge. I think they're reputable. I think they've got a good, um, a good variety. Who? Gardens of the Blue Ridge, and you can oh. order online. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Laura, we are removing the invasives from around Chastain Park, trying to get some of the wildflowers to come back. We have found Trillium, what other flowers should we be looking out for? And where are you around Chastain Park? Yeah, in like in the in the park itself. No, in the wooded areas of the park where. Okay. Um, but within the park, um, well, the more common ones are going to be probably ginger, pipsisawa. Um, do you know that? Maybe rattlesnake plantain, and these are small, but these are pretty common. Um, so I'd look for those. I would look for um, maybe bloodroot. I have um, a place up at Lake Lanier Woods mostly, and I have found a lot of black cohosh there. So if you don't know that plant, you might look it up so you recognize it, but it's a great plant. Thank you. It's futile to try to take these wildflowers and put them in a formal garden, or does it have to be a cottage garden? No, the last slide that I showed, it's a sunny garden, but I haven't mixed in with um, my more traditional plants. And, you know, it all depends on how you garden. You can keep anything looking neat and, and formal if, if that's your, your preference. So I think it depends more on how you garden than you know, what you garden. Well, that's sort of true, but there are a lot of plants that, I mean, like pokeweed, you can groom it, but it's still gonna look wild and crazy. <laughs> true. <laughs> Laura, we could have this go on for the rest of our membership meeting because it's just been wonderful, but due to um, time, I'm going to need to um, 
move this along. So I would like to ask, is there any final question out there that anyone or comment that anyone would like to present to Laura? I would like to ask if we could have a, a tour of your yard one day. <laughs> Yes, like, yes. Like, like virtually. Uh, yes, it Jennifer and I had talked about that. I would love that because I I love my garden. And I have to say COVID's been really good for my garden. I am out there every day. Casey and Calloway said that the best fertilizer was footsteps of the gardener. And I so believe that, you know, I'm not traveling, I'm not going anywhere. So I am in my garden a lot and would love love to invite all of you there is, is this a good time um of the year to do it because we love to do yeah. like a vert okay so you tell us when <laughs> no i definitely have a spring garden you know okay. early april late march my garden is in peak bloom we so will catch you then that sounds great let me add that i think maybe jennifer put out my email address that which is at Nature Based Blog, Laura at Nature Based Blog. Please feel free to contact me if you have questions or comments or whatever. Thank you again, Laura. And um, I, I will be getting back in touch.